Dr. Richardson, thank you so much for joining me today to share your perspective on current affairs and um, a historical perspective on what's going on today. It's great to see you again. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So I'd like to start by asking you a few questions about your recently published book, How the South Won the Civil War. Um, you go into depth in your study of the evolution of the Republican Party, and it seems more relevant today than ever before. So I'm wondering what prompted you to write this book? Well, I'd actually just finished a book on the history of the Republicans themselves. And one of the things that really jumped out at me during the Obama administration was how frequently his opponents waved the Confederate flag or talked about Confederate monuments or used the exact same, literally the exact same language that Confederates had before the Civil War in the 1850s leading up to the, their, um, their secession in 1861. And what was really striking to me was there is um, a very famous book by Barry Goldwater. Uh, it was actually uh, ghost written by somebody else, but it's published over his name in 1960 called The Conscience of a Conservative. And if you knew your history, you knew that he was saying very many Many of the same things that James Henry Hammond had said in 1858 in a speech before the Senate in which he argued that society really worked best when you uh, turned it over to a few wealthy, well-connected men to run it for everybody else. And I wanted to understand how those ideas had gotten from the 1850s in the American South to essentially the halls of power in America right now in the 21st century. And that started me digging and one thing led to another and pretty soon I had uh, I think tried to come up not only with an explanation for that, but also for a larger explanation of the way politics works. So it, with regards to the Civil War history and like kind of this referendum we're seeing on history recently, especially with regards to the Civil War, um, I know that discussing Civil War history with my grandpa, he's a big um, history buff, but he has been so surprised by how um, the history he was taught is so different from what we're, what we're starting to come to realize today, this change in narrative in history. Um, so how do you see your book and others impacting how schools teach the Civil War in the future? Well, there's two questions there. One is the way historians look at the past. The other is how people teach the past. And those are very different things. So what I did in um, how the South won the Civil War was um, really sort of pulled together a lot of things that historians have been saying for a while now. And if anybody actually looks at the notes, you'll see that there's an awful lot of references to newer, younger historians and the tremendous work they're doing, for example, on indigenous enslavement or on um, the, um, the cultural implications of the Chicana movement in the eight, 1960s. So historians, professional historians, are not that far off of um, a, a new reinterpretation of what America really is. And one of the things that has made that possible, of course, is the inclusion of so many different voices in our society. Now for a historian, the real problem with that is that our sources are simply not as good um, for non-white people simply because they, their work wasn't archived to the degree that the great white men were, if you will. But how that then translates to classrooms and to people's understandings in general of our history is a very different thing because what historians know does not automatically go into the classroom. And that's a different story about how we approach education and the political pressures on parents and teachers and administrators when they try to give students a, a good well-rounded picture of America. So now that's interesting because obviously we see um, differences in education in higher or lower income communities and um, based on geographic location. Um, so do you see that there is a different historical narrative about the Civil War still being taught in um, the South versus up here in the North? Yes, very much so. Uh, there are very many regional differences in the way we teach. And one of the things that interests me about education is that, of course, we don't have really a national system of education at all. Each state manages their educational systems in their own way. And I know you're coming to me from Massachusetts, from Arlington, which has one of the best um, educational systems in the country. And Massachusetts, of course, is uh, 
I, I shouldn't, I don't have statistics, statistics in front of me, but if it is not the best, it's, it's quite close to it. And, um, and, and in the, the, when Americans look at their educational system and lament it, one of the things that is really dramatic to those of us who look at educational systems is if you break out the states as opposed to looking at America, but break out by state. Some of our states, like Massachusetts, rank with the best in the world in terms of education. And some of our states, Louisiana, Louisiana and Mississippi, tend to be the two at the bottom, rank among some of the worst in the world. And those differences in um, teacher funding, in um, the, the materials that are available to the students, the income levels of the students in the classrooms, uh, and certainly the, the emphasis they put on different kinds of educational fields really, really matters in how students emerge from those classrooms. And that, of course, does depend in part on the materials that are going into the classrooms. I mean, what do the textbooks look like? Are there textbooks? Um, or are teachers given room to be more creative in what they do? So there are, um, because of our federalist system, if you will, there are very big differences in education in the way people understand their history. And I think it's not just that. I think really in the last 20 years or more, there has tend to be a, a denigration of the humanities and a focus on what we call STEM. And that's very important, of course, you know, the, the, I, I always used to say at another university I taught at that, you know, STEM is incredibly important because STEM people tell us um, how to make things work, but humanities tell us why to make things work. And the denigration of that over the past several decades, I think, has done nobody a service because people simply don't know where we came from. And until you know we, where we came from, you can't know where we're going. That's interesting that you bring that up, the emphasis on the STEM versus humanity. So I am from New Jersey and I have a friend who's an English teacher. And um, there used to be this policy that after teaching for 10 years in the state, having gone to a state college, they would um, they would uh, pay off your, the rest of your student loans. And now they're only doing that for STEM teachers. So wow. it's really a, a, like I, I really have seen how that's impacted people um, who are in the humanities field. Um, obviously you are yourself, but that's, it's more what we're talking about on the local public school um, geographically different level. Well, there was a, an important moment, um, uh, and now, of course, I can't come up off the top of my head with when it was, but when um, um, Scott Walker took over the governorship of Wisconsin, he changed the mission of the University of Wisconsin from being an attempt to create a, an educated population, uh, I, and I don't have the words at the top of my head, but the University of Wisconsin's mission was to go ahead and create informed citizens. And he changed that to saying, we're going to prepare people for jobs. And there was an outcry about that. And a lot of people didn't understand why um, so many politicians and academics were concerned about that. But the reason was that the University of Wisconsin was uh, the one of the primary spaces of what was called the Wisconsin Experiment, which was the basis of uh, the progressive era legislation at the turn of the last century in which um, uh, government and business and uh, scholars came together to try and do what was best for the state's people and its economy to create a well-rounded state. And to rip that apart and say, no, 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 we just want to make workers was a really um, dramatic moment in the way we understand education in this country. Mm. That's interesting. So um, what do you see as a tangible action that can be um, that can be taken by the new administration, obviously that's the federal level, but what, what could be changed on the federal level to impact this um, dichotomy in um, how education is run? It's no small thing that Dr. Biden is going to be the first lady. She is a community college teacher. She did not stop teaching when she was the, um, the wife of the vice president of the United States. And you know, my thing is always that the way you change society is by changing the way people think about things. And there has been, I remember back when um, in the 1970s, when my mother was still alive, she um, loathed Ronald Reagan. 
and she loathed him not because of his politics, although perhaps there was something there as well, but because she felt he denigrated education because he so frequently said, you know, there's all this talk about Ivy Leagues and he took pot shots at Ivy League educations whenever he could. Um, but, you know, I went, I was a C student at Eureka College and look where I am, I'm president of the United States. And she said, this is going to cause incalculable damage because people are going to feel that education is not important any longer. And it, education certainly is not the be all and end all, um, you know, the, that, uh, that people have to do a four year college or anything I don't agree with. But the idea that we should be trying to learn and should be trying to make positive intellectual contributions to our society um, is very, very important. And I think that changing, changing that narrative uh, with Dr. Biden in the White House will really help us recognize that we need education in this country. And people, um, I, people I think are hearing that. Certainly in my field, uh, when I went into academia in the 1980s, um, not uh, simply because I, I couldn't have done anything else. That was, uh, that was where my heart was. Um, there were lots, there was lots of sense that I was wasting my time. And now, of course, um, people seem to be very happy to talk to scholars who understand, among other things, our, our political situation. Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and interesting that you, that you point out that you felt at some point that academia was not respected, because I, I do feel today it is something that people do look to. And this, especially right now, um, looking at your letters, um, letters from an American. Um, I am really interested in talking about that because it is such a direct from an expert to the people way of teaching um, and way of informing. And I think that's why the New York Times really called you the most successful independent journalist um, in America right now. That because I know you've, you say that you sort of fell into that title, but um, I, I want to know what this um, daily labor that is your newsletter and obviously the supplemental videos, um, what motivated you to create them? Um, well, you are the first to pick up the word teacher in that. Uh, and I think that that matters a lot. I have been a teacher since 1987 and I love teaching um, because I love, it's a funny thing. I love bringing people into the world that I see so vividly. I often think of it as, um, you know, the holodeck in Star Wars. If you, I'm sorry, Star Trek. If you ever watch Star Trek: The Next Generation, there's this room in the starship where you can go in and you can imagine a world into life. And that's what I do with history, except I don't have to imagine it. I can actually read the documents and look at the videos and and uh, read the letters and watch the world come to life around me. And to me, it is. Um, I don't want to use the word magical because it's real, but it is very, very vivid. So often you will hear me talk about the past in present tense because I can see it. And I've, I love it. And I've always wanted to bring people into that world with me, um, rather as if coming into, um, into a movie because it is, again, so visceral. Um, and that's actually how I got involved in the, in the field myself. Uh, that's, a, that's sort of a different story, but, um, but it was a, an experience where I recognized the power of the past to help us understand the present. So I've always loved to teach. That's always been sort of my happy place. So, so when I write those letters, I am not at all with my teacher hat on. They're very different than I act in a classroom, but it was is with an eye to saying, hey, I don't understand what an executive order is. So let's take a look at that and let's see how we got an executive order and we're doing it together. And so there is a feeling perhaps of a classroom um, a, a collaborative classroom in those letters. Certainly, I consider them a collaborative effort between me and my readers. And, um, and maybe that gives it a different tone uh, when I do them. But I sort of feel like we're all kind of on this journey together. And I'm just the person who is holding up the mirror for everybody else and maybe a flashlight as well. I love that analogy. And I do feel that many people, I mean, you have over, I believe, 200,000 people reading your newsletter. Um, and that's not counting the people who are following you on Facebook. Uh, this is, I know we've mentioned this before, this is a constant effort that you're putting in every day. Um, it, it's re it really is a service, so I thank you. I know, it, I know it's exhausting, and um, really people do appreciate this hole that you're filling in, in the media. Um, and about the, um, this, this, yeah, this kind of 
section that you are fulfilling for people that I don't think they felt they had before. Um, I guess I'm wondering with this widespread distrust of mainstream media that we're hearing about, and obviously you're like, you're very direct to the people and people love that. Um, where does the media go from there to get that same sort of, to reestablish a credibility that you are finding very well? Well, I, I want to start with that by saying that, um, that I think the distrust, if you will, of the mainstream media is constructed and it's a constructed narrative on the part of um, the, the people in currently in charge of the Republican Party. Now, I've always made a distinction between the Republican Party and its traditional form and the people who took it over beginning in the 1980s and really making a run for it in the 1990s and who now are, as of uh, when, uh, Wednesday, I guess it is Wednesday's vote on impeachment of President Trump for um, insurrection are actually now siding with insurrection. I mean, those are not traditional Republicans at all. Um, so I want to make that distinction. And one of the things about that group of people who came from a very distinctive ideological strand, the movement conservatives, um, they have a real problem because what they are trying to sell, the idea of a government that does not um, regulate business, does not, not provide a basic social safety net, does not invest in infrastructure, but instead uh, basically turns business loose to do whatever it wants and promotes a uh, very restrictive religious, um, almost a theocracy. Those are not popular ideas in America. There are um, a number of studies that will show you that most Americans don't think that way and don't want the sort of laws that the movement conservatives are pushing. So in order to make those take hold, they need to create a narrative. And one of their narratives is to tear the bottom out of actual um, media and say, oh, it's, it's, it's false, it's not right. That is a hallmark of authoritarian regimes. I mean, you had uh, Germany talked about the lying press in the 1930s. Um, certainly Vladimir Putin talks about the the, the fake news in, in uh, his country and, and, and Donald Trump has really pushed that, but that's been a long standing thing. Way back as far as Richard Nixon in the Watergate um, crisis in the 1970s, he talked about the liberal media, as he said, that was out to get him. That's very much a constructed, constructed narrative. Um, the media itself, the American media itself does a really good job at a time when its money has been raked out from underneath it for various reasons and it's it's having huge financial troubles and our media most of our media is really very very good the issue i think is um, that there is a bit of a divorce be between our excellent journalists and um, the people they don't normally reach. And I have this weird opportunity for a couple of reasons, both because I'm an older woman, and so I'm speaking to uh, uh, maybe a population that me the media has not tended to focus on in the past, and because I'm from the country and have a, a sort of outside perspective, I'm able to, um, to reach a different group of people than others have. Um, I don't think I'm doing anything special uh, in terms of what I'm doing, except as I say, sort of translating what's out there for people who are not necessarily served by other populations. So I want to make uh, other media, I want to make it clear that I'm not in any way criticizing the, the media that's out there. But the, your question was, how do you, how can media um, expand this, um, whatever is happening with Letters from an American. And I think people are. I mean, you have um, Jed, uh, Judd Legum do, is doing a, a Substack publication called Popular Information. He's the one who began breaking the stories about the major co uh, companies that were ceasing to support um, Donald Trump and the insurrectionists. Um, that's only one, of course, but you have uh, good, uh, good, um, um, population, uh, good uh, magazines like The Dispatch, which is a collection of individual journalists who have come together to produce this new conservative magazine that's really quite smart. Um, and um, there, there is almost an end run around the established and quite expensive to produce media forms into um, more popular forms. Uh, we don't have gatekeepers though, and that's one of the things that is going to change right now. Um, I hope people feel they can trust me because I do cite all my sources, um, which is very unusual for media, but there's no other reason for anybody to look at a college professor like me and say, oh yeah, she understands what's happening in on the floor of Congress. Um, I, I source it. 
um, there are going to be a lot of people out there that are not trustworthy. And my guess is that we will end up with some form of gatekeepers again in the future, but they're probably not going to be the same gatekeepers we have right now because they're, the, the demographics of news are changing and who is going to have a say over what is news is changing as well. So I'd say within 10 years, you're probably going to see a different kind of media, but the, the, the gist is going to be the same. It's going to be based in fact, and there are going to be a set of gate, gatekeepers and um, and there's going to have to be some new financial structure to it. So this term gatekeepers, I think, is like so important right now when we uh, explore the fact that Twitter and Facebook and now just recently YouTube, which seem to be kind of the last um, big media platform to ban Trump um, from using the platform. So I guess I'm curious, is it their place as like a private company to censor the, the president? Well, there's an important distinction to be made. Um, it, it is technically not censorship at all because censorship comes from the government. Our First Amendment protects the, the press from being um, silenced by the government. Uh, a private company can, can do anything it wants. Uh, so it's not actually censorship, although that's certainly what um, certain people are screaming about. You can have anybody you want on your platform or not have anybody you want on your platform. Of course, with some limits. There, there are limits around that. But the idea that somehow Twitter is um, uh, being harsh to the president is always sort of eye-opening to me because, of course, the president is part of the government. And the idea that he is being silenced when he has an entire press corps that he can summon at any moment is um, is is just just backward. Um, that being said, what uh, the people who are complaining about not having access to Twitter and Facebook, um, those tend to be QAnon accounts or extremist accounts. I believe I read the number last night that 70,000 accounts have been taken down off of, I believe it's Twitter, it might have been Facebook. And um, there is the, what they really are eager to do is to control the narrative. And that is dangerous in a, in a, um, in a democracy when you can have people um, sharing calls for insurrection, for example, um, that's something that um, that really is not sustainable in a democracy. Now, how you can do that and still protect both free speech and protect the fact or be aware of the fact that the government really has very little ability currently to come down on things that are not uh, licensed by the government. The old fairness doctrine that uh, uh, Ronald Reagan let lapse in or the FCC under Reagan let lapse in 1987 uh, was enforceable because you had to have a broadcast license and the government could simply say you can't have a broadcast license unless you're going to, to be fact-based and present both sides of a question. That's not the case on YouTube. You and I can have YouTube channels. I have one. I don't know if you have one. And so how can the government um, oversee that and, and the fact that it really doesn't have much to do with those private corporations is not really clear to me yet. There is a solution. I don't have that solution. But it's definitely something that we need to have on the table simply because a democracy is not viable if what is flooding the airwaves is, is uh, propaganda. So these people that were following the say QAnon accounts or right, right, right wing extremist accounts that no longer exist, where do you think they turn to now? Obviously they are a national movement and they need to coordinate their efforts some way. Um, where do they turn to to uh, communicate? Well, there are, uh, just because those particular ones have been shut down, um, that doesn't mean that they won't exist any longer. There is, uh, there are plenty of places on, uh, on the web where um, there are extremist platforms, more and more extremist platforms, and they are often housed on servers outside the country. I mean, it is certainly possible to do that. There always are going to be those people. There always have been, there always will be. What removing um, those, those uh, propaganda accounts from more mainstream platforms like Twitter and, and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat this morning, um, by removing them from more um, uh, mainstream platforms, what it does is it signals that that is not actually true, that you're actually, you're, 
if you have to go searching alongside the neo-Nazis, for example, you recognize that this could not be true. Whereas if it should, it is possible that this is not true or it, this, should, this would not be true in a way that if it just pops up on your YouTube account when you're watching other channels, you might not recognize, for example, that a video um, arguing that um, Dr. Anthony Fauci was uh, responsible for COVID-19. Yeah, that really made the rounds a few months ago and it was absolutely ridiculous, but people saw it the same way that that propaganda um, that has always been there didn't used to, to reach people because you had to know where to find it. Mm. So obviously they were able to organize for this insurrection as we're calling it. it seems to be the word that people have decided on the insurrection on the Capitol uh, last Wednesday. And I'm curious on your perspective of how comparisons are being made to the Black Lives Matter protests. That seemed to be a big argument that was maybe not fully fleshed out by Republicans in um, on the House floor during the impeachment hearing, but they were clearly alluding to the idea that there is some double standard um, with regards to the Black Lives Matter protests this past summer and how this is being handled. What do you think about the difference of how they're being handled and the invocation of these Black Lives Matter protests in justifying the insurrection. Um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because let's step back for a minute. For the first time in our history, armed insurrectionists mobbed the United States Capitol where our Congress was meeting to count the votes in, in the certified votes in a presidential election. They came within a minute of breaking into the Senate and holding our elected representatives hostage at best, and they had erected a gallows outside. This is the most profound attack on our electoral system in our history, okay? And then last summer, there were riots in, a, no, there were not. There were protests in a number of cities over the fact that um, uh, law enforcement officers had been um, using undue force on people of color, especially African-Americans. Those attacks are on tape. I mean, we all watched as the uh, police officers knee was on the neck of uh, Mr. Floyd in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. and. And, and, and we watched him kill the man. And Breonna Taylor in St. Louis, Missouri, um, uh, shot because the police were in the wrong place, shot and killed in her own home, uh, which is a really hard one. I have to say, she's the same age as one of my children. And I've had, that's the one that really stuck out in, in my mind. Um, you know, she, I see her as one of the kids who was around my dining room table. And all she did was went to bed that night and the police assassinated her so um there are so many that's yeah. that's that's the one that sticks out but it, it seems that everybody has one in their head because there's such a selection of them and so those uh protests those black lives matter protests took off in a number of cities uh and and towns and, and places all around the country and in some cities they combined with fury over other problems within those cities especially with law enforcement in those cities so the protests went on for a long time now if you actually look at who got arrested and who was arrested for violence in those cities it was overwhelmingly right-wing agitators who came in to cause trouble with the protesters. And when, for example, um, the right wing in American politics right now talks about the, the police officer murdered in the Black Lives Matter protests, um, that, that did in fact happen. But the man was shot by a right wing protester. He was not shot by, by somebody who was part of the Black Lives Matter protest of law enforcement. It was by somebody who came to um, to disrupt law enforcement altogether. Uh, so the, so the, the comparison is, I think, again, propaganda. If you look at what's on the ground, uh, there, there are good reasons to protest what uh, has been happening between law enforcement officers and especially people of color in our country. And I think the fact that we have now had a number of um, uh, uh, law enforcement officers uh, arrested by the FBI in connection with storming the Capitol indicates that there might in fact be a problem with some of the people in our law enforcement agencies, not all by any means, but certainly some of them. Um, 
And that's a very different thing from storming the Capitol where our elected representatives were counting the certified votes. I mean, the voting's been done. They were counting the certified votes of an election which a president had won by more than 7 million votes in the popular vote and by uh, 232 to 306 in the Electoral College. This is not a close vote. So, um, so to compare those two things is um, I think sort of the false equivalence that, again, this group of Republicans has run on for a very long time. Uh, somebody pointed out that this morning that although um, the Republicans did impeach uh, Bill Clinton for sexual activity, um, in fact, the Democrats did not impeach Ronald Reagan for the Iran-Contra Act, uh, George W. Bush for claiming that there were mass, uh, weapons of mass destruction that took us into Iraq, into a war that we are still in. I mean, I could go down the list, um, but there is this real false equivalency that is, again, a pattern of the way people talk in politics uh, to obtain dominance. And the Republicans have mastered it, and the Democrats really more often rhetorically take the position of being the conciliators, trying to move on. And the very fact we're in this moment now where uh, Republican supporters have stormed the Capitol and now their supporters are insisting that it's the Democrats who are out of line because they are not unifying the country is classic abusive language that, um, that I think really finally maybe Americans can see through that vision of, um, you know, the fact that these people actually um, killed a police officer uh, by, by, by pounding him with a fire extinguisher. Um, and the look of you know those people in our people's house that was a real wake up call for a lot of people. I, I hope anyway. Right. So that is something that I have really been grappling with. Um, this wake up call. It seemed, and it has seemed this way before. Like, oh, this is the time when there is some sort of revelation. And watching the impeachment hearing, um, there were quite a few Republicans who made that argument that this um, this was an unimpeachable offense. So it's, it's very interesting to um, obviously to experience that in our history. But I'm wondering, what do you think about the impeachment logistically? Obviously, it's coming at a very inopportune time. We're about to have a new president and he has his own agenda. How do you see this impacting his first hundred days, his presidency? Well, the, just about the impeachment hearings, I mean, again, as a scholar of political parties, it's a, it's a really interesting moment because uh, the Republicans have gone down this path and a number of them are in too deep to back out. And um, you can see that, of course, with Josh Hawley, the senator from Missouri, who has been widely a pan on the Republican side for uh, legitimizing this, the, the fake claims about the election. Um, you can see it with Ted Cruz, who has been taped um, telling his people to go fight. You can see it with Matt Gatz, of course, and Jim Jordan, both in the House, people who have urged on the idea that the election was illegitimate and urged their people to fight. You can see it with some of the new people coming in. So there are people who are simply in too deep to back out. But I thought, and they, again, are used to rallying people with propaganda. And you, that's exactly what you saw happening yesterday. But what was really interesting yesterday um, in terms of the way people talked about uh, impeachment was what people didn't say. And one of the things that really jumped out to me yesterday was, first of all, the fact that this was the largest um, bipartisan vote for an impeachment in American history. You had 10 Republicans crossing the aisle. You also had a number of Republicans going in front of the media saying that they, um, that they were frightened for their lives if they voted against Donald Trump, which is really interesting because a year ago in the first impeachment trial when um, uh, Adam Schiff, who was the House impeachment manager, said, uh, reported the CBS report that, uh, or mentioned the CBS report that said that people were afraid uh, of voting against Trump then and he would have their head in a pike. There was this pearl clutching on the Republican side saying, that's ridiculous, nothing, then we don't think that. And then, of course, a year later, that is exactly what they are saying. So those things were interesting, but what was really interesting to me is what didn't happen. And what didn't happen yesterday was not a single person from the White House. Uh, 
with the, 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 the minor exception of Jason Miller, who tried to go ahead and, and make a few statements, not a single person defended the president. Even the White House counsel threw his hands up, who had, who had defended him so a year ago, um, threw his hands up and he was like, I got nothing because this is so beyond the pale. So what you saw in front of the cameras yesterday was the posturing that a certain group of people have to do or feel they have to do to try and get themselves out from under this mess and keep their people behind them. And maybe they're true believers too. Um, but what was interesting is how many people did not support that. And the fact that the White House, like, did you see Jared out in front of the cameras? Did you see even the, the boys? And what I interpreted from Trump's message last night when he came out and gave a, 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 a very conciliatory speech um, uh, was that he recognizes he's in real legal trouble. So, so that's part of what's going on. Now, in terms of what's going to happen with Biden's administration, you know, Biden does not want his, his agenda to still have Donald Trump in it, right? And that's essentially what uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell was doing when he sort of threatened early on here that he was going to push this into the Biden administration. He was basically saying, hey, Joe, you really want your administration to be about this? But I think that the Democrats understand that they simply must, there simply must be punishment for what has happened, or it's simply going to get worse. And, and the other piece that is here um, is that every day we're learning worse and worse and worse things. And that pushing it off a week even will mean that we will know even more. You know, you see this on Twitter, everyone's like, oh my God, did you know this? Did you know this? And I'm always sitting there thinking, well, if you and I know it, you know the FBI and the Department of Justice know a lot more than we do. They're not idiots over there. So more and more is going to come out. And as that happens, it will become easier for senators to convict Donald Trump. And especially after he's off, out of office, what difference does it make to them to, to convict a man who's already out of office? So by buying time, um, McConnell either, either gets to the point where people don't care anymore, or uh, it's easier to convict Trump, and it trips up Biden, which McConnell would like very much to do. Now, what they can do, and most people don't recognize, is that they split the Senate splits their days. So in the first impeachment trial, in fact, the Supreme Court was actually in session. So um, Chief Justice John Roberts would actually be in the court in the morning and in the Senate in the afternoon. And that's what they'll do in um, after uh, July 20, uh, January 20th. They'll split their days. So they'll have the impeachment trial on in one part of the day. And they'll actually maybe do Senate business the other part of the day. And, um, and it's unfortunate, but um, I think it's really got to happen. I think that I've, I've had a long standing bet with people that Trump would not finish his uh, term since the very beginning because of his personality. His personality is a uh, run it into the ground, then take my marbles and move on to something else, uh, as he did, for example, with the American Football League. Um, he may, in fact, I may lose those bets, and it's going to cost me um, cookies. It's going to cost me um, some donations to charities. Um, but I had to laugh because what I hadn't figured out uh, when when I was saying it was still going to happen is, of course, that Biden's supposed to be the 46th president. But if Trump doesn't make it the next week, Pence will be the 46th president, and Biden will be the 47th president. And if that happens, all the paraphernalia, all the letterheads, all the everything is going to have to be redone. And I think of the logistics of that, which I don't know, for some reason, that kind of amuses me in the middle of all that, being, you know, being the poor guy who's made all the t-shirts going, ah, oh, crap, I got the number wrong. I mean, who saw that one coming? 2021's got as many surprises so far as 2020 had. That's for sure. <laughs> it has been quite a, what is it, two weeks? Yeah, two weeks by now. <laughs> um, just two weeks. That just two weeks. Um, hopefully within this year, I know a lot of people have talked about it being a year of reconciliation and recovery. Obviously, we have the pandemic. And it's, you know, when this first happened the, um, on Wednesday with the insurrection, I was sitting there um, the whole day watching the news. And then later on, I was like, gosh, I really forgot about the pandemic. I've been sitting here all day watching this storming of the Capitol and I forgot. And that's, that's something that is pretty concerning that, um, that that is sort of taking, I don't want to say a back seat, but maybe equal, equal time. And do you think that it is, that the price of pursuing conviction is worth taking time away from that agenda? I don't think it's a question of taking the time away from that agenda. That um, 
the the Senate will move as the Senate moves, and the Senate really doesn't have a role in, in right now in combating coronavirus. That the issue there is Biden's team not having access to the information um, that uh, Trump's team has. And there was a really interesting moment um, shortly after. Uh, finally, the Trump team permitted the Biden team to start the transition, which again was astonishing that they stopped that transition as long as they did, in which um, Biden actually went in front of the cameras and he says, you know, there doesn't seem to be a plan for the distribution of this vaccine. And Alex Azar, the uh, director of um, uh, Health and Human Services, went on Fox News and he's on a Sunday and he said, you know, well, respect, respectfully, that's nonsense. We've done this and this and this and this and this. And it's a really impressive list. And, um, and, and then when it came time to roll the, the, the vaccine out, it turned out that Biden was right. There really wasn't a plan that the Trump administration sort of said, we'll get it to the states and then good luck. And um, Biden, I think, recognizes having, uh, you know, his chief of staff, um, Ron Klain, was responsible for uh, the Ebola um, uh, fight in America and obviously did an amazing job of that. So they've been on this for a long time, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the Senate trial. I think what you're reacting to is, again, the media, what they have um, have the wavelength to do. And I will say, again, re giving real sympathy here to journalists, um, there's too much going on. I mean, you can't not cover an insurrection. You, you just have to. But other stuff goes by the wayside. For so, just see so for the for the comparison here. For the last week, you know, I try and limit the upper level of my nightly letter to twelve hundred words. I will go as high as fifteen hundred if there's something big. And I did a year wrap up that was two thousand. That's a lot of words. Um, and every night this week, my first draft of my letters has been five thousand words or slightly above. And then I have to cut out more than 3,000 words. Um, and, and, you know, I, I literally, I look at it and it hits the floor, you know, it, it gets thrown out. And, um, uh, and I think how, I, people need to know this, but we just all have a certain way, you know, a certain bandwidth and there is room for it. So last night, for example, I wrote about impeachment and all that. And again, I was thousands of words over. And, um, and I, I had to put in the Israeli strikes on Iran. I mean, I, on, on the Iranian-backed militias. I just had to because it's so important. And I had to put in the coronavirus. But I spent more than an hour trying to figure out how I could work that into the story of impeachment um, because there's just too much for most people to have their bandwidth uh, available for. So, um, so those things are still going to go on. It's, but the media simply hasn't been able to call attention to them. And, and as you point out, um, yesterday, I believe it was the fir for the first time, we had almost 4,400 Americans die from COVID-19, which is a horrific number. And um, we're well on track to be over 400,000 dead before the inauguration. And um, these numbers are unthinkable. They are unthinkable. And yet there's just not the bandwidth to cover that and foreign affairs, where there's a bunch of stuff happening as well with Taiwan and China. And you know, what's happening with Israel and the Iranian-backed militias in Iran and, you know, the insurrection on the Capitol. And, you know, it's, it's just too much for people to, to handle. I think it's why we're all exhausted, among other things. Right. This is, I mean, you especially must be exhausted. I know some of your letters come out in the middle of the night when <laughs> nobody else is awake, but they're always there and people really appreciate that. Um, I just real quick, I want, I want your opinion on... Um, the legacy. So the Trump legacy. What is it and how much has it been impacted by this past week? So I, I'm going to be a jerk here and, and, and refer first of all to Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom, one of the greatest novels of all time. And, and the, the point, and I, I'm trying not to make this a spoiler, it's sort of the point of Absalom, Absalom is that you can't know what the past means until you know the future. So, um, you know, uh, what, what will Trump's legacy be? Will he be the first president, uh, you know, certainly the first president impeached twice, but will he be the first president convicted um, uh, of um, uh, insurrection? Or will he be the first president to have established an autocracy and uh, to pass the presidency onto his offspring? Until we know that, we won't really know what this legacy is. But 
from where we sit at this moment today, and I will emphasize that things are changing every second, um, Trump, I think, is the end of an era. Um, and and I, I, that warrants a longer conversation because um, one of the things that fascinated me about his rise, and he governed differently than he ran, by the way. In many ways, he was very similar, but one of the things people tend to forget nowadays is when he ran in 2016, he was the most moderate Republican candidate of the 16. He was the one who talked about universal health care. He was the one who talked about making uh, tax laws uh, fair. He was the one who talked about rebuilding the, the working class, all the sorts of things that the other people on those stage, on the, the, the debate stages did not talk about. And that fascinated me because he, in 2016, had the language that movement conservatives had been using since the beginning. The idea that white people were under siege by people of color, the idea that you know it was them who was causing trouble, the fact that we were a Christian nation, all the things that movement conservatives had been running on and may, had made them dog whistles, he brought out and threw on the table. But he also recognized this deep anger on the part of ordinary Americans who had been dramatically left behind since 1981 when legislation started to concentrate wealth upward. So I felt like he was this funny moment of a reflection of what was around him. I mean, he's a narcissist. He mirrors people back to themselves. And he both mirrored the, the propaganda of the Republican Party at the time, but also uh, this rising realization on the part of his supporters that that, that government had not actually delivered what they had expected it to. And so I felt like he was a picture of the minute that the tide changed. It was both the past and the future crashing together into him. And of course, he didn't govern that way. He governed, um, it, 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 uh, that's, that's maybe part of his legacy, but not my, my point here. Um, so it felt to me, it feels to me, as, a, as somebody who's observing the larger sweep of American political parties, he is the rock on which the post-World War II Ronald Reagan era Republican Party has broken. And it's going to have to emerge either as an autocratic party or it's going to split back into um, the, the fringe movement conservatives and a more traditional Republican Party. And if that happens, if we get a more traditional Republican Party, we will get what we had after World War II with um, both a Republican Party and a Democratic Party sharing the values of liberalism, small l liberalism, the idea that the government has a role to play, regulating business, uh, providing a basic social safety net, and investing in infrastructure. And that, after all, is what most Americans want. It's just in the past, Republicans and Democrats looked at that in slightly different ways, and they argued about it. Um, since you had this wrecking ball of the movement conservatives coming in and rejecting that kind of a government altogether, our government really has been paralyzed. And, um, and if we really do that break now, we could see a, a, a much more functional government that is much more responsive to America, the same way we did after similar crises in the 1850s, the 1890s, and the 1920s. If that doesn't happen, we'll, we'll go full autocracy, but I, I basically don't see that happening. So I see him as the end of something, really. Um, I will say that I... I, I suspect I don't speak, uh, suspect I speak for a lot of people when I say, um, I will be so happy if we really are seeing the other side of this man. I am exhausted from wondering every day what's gonna happen. Um, the, the things that have, I mean, one of the things that he does is he explodes every day because he has to have all eyes on him. And coming of age as you have during his presidency, you are probably not as aware as older people are that, this is completely abnormal. You used to be able to go at least a week without even thinking about the federal government and certainly not worrying every day about what might happen. There was one day when I was writing a letter and there were, I, there were like seven things that had happened that day that would have been administration defining events for any other administration. And we had had seven of them in one day. And I just think we're all exhausted. I certainly am. I can't wait to be bored by Joe Biden. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> um, I mean, democracy is not supposed to be as exciting as it has been as of recently. Um, so just one final question. Um, with, with regards to President Trump's administration and um, this taxing feeling that 
it has placed on the American public. Do you see him as being remembered as the worst president in history? Yes. Um, but but not because he's exhausting. Um, there there are plenty of things that have been hugely problematic in his um, in his administration. But there are two that that have seemed to me to be to have vaulted him to that uh, or dropped him to that status. And the first, as you say, is coronavirus. Um, he could not have stopped that from coming to America for sure. But uh, there's there's absolutely no reason that we should be leading the world in deaths. And, um, and this, this disaster did not have to happen. And right now, we are looking at more than 400,000 recorded deaths from coronavirus. And we are, it, it's worse than ever before right now, not getting better. Um, this is a disaster of unprecedented scale and completely inexcusable. I mean, if, if a foreign country had come in and killed this many Americans, um, you know, it would have been unthinkable. And, and we, are, we are watching it happen because of incompetence at best at the federal level. But then in addition to that, of course, we have the January 6th insurrection. And that, um, that on anybody's watch would have been um, uh, a, a defining moment that, that dropped you to the bottom of the pack, um, especially considering uh, the degree to which it appears both Trump and his family and certainly members of, of his party have encouraged that. And again, don't forget that that is not simply uh, people storming a building. That was insurgents uh, breaking into our Capitol building, which is where Congress meets. And at that moment, Congress was meeting to count the votes, the certified votes for the 2020 election. And what that meant was that the three next people in line for the presidency after Donald Trump were in that building. And the insurgents came within a minute of getting their hands on those people. And, and those insurgents killed people. And they were carrying flex cuffs, which are not zip ties. You know, Matt Gatt's talking about everybody having zip ties. I've got zip ties. Those are flex cuffs, which are literally handcuffs that zip closed. They're plastic and they zip closed. Um, it's hard to imagine that this was going to end well uh, had they gotten their hands on our elected representatives. And, and honestly, that has kept me up at night. Very little keeps me up at night. We came so close to the worst day in American history um, within a minute of it. Um, I, 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 that's one that, that we will be digesting for a very long time. And those two things to get, either one of them would have been enough to put Trump at the bottom of our presidential scale, but taken together, um, the, the only good thing I can see coming out of this is that Americans have woken up to the idea that who sits in the Oval Office really matters, and maybe we'll be more careful in the future about who we put there. Well, we have um, less than a week left of this administration, um, what's left of it. Uh, obviously, we'll see where the impeachment goes, whether or not a conviction occurs, and Either way, we're going to have a new president on January 20th. And with all the security that this has brought about, um, this insurrection and the threats that are so scary, <laughs> but it has brought about a level of security that I think can make us confident there will be a peaceful transition of power. Um, I, I, I believe that nothing will happen, uh, I hope nothing will happen on Inauguration Day, but we've already lost the peaceful transition of power. Um, people died on January 6th, and uh, there was an armed insurrection in the Capitol. Our peaceful transition of power is over. Um, I don't think it has to be, a, this, we can make this an aberration. Um, and, and I have very mixed feelings about the National Guard uh, sleeping on the floors of the Capitol to keep it safe. Um, partly I'm horrified, but partly I feel like that's what makes America have the opportunity to come beyond this. Those are my neighbors. Those are my students. Those are my friends. And they are literally putting their bodies between wrongdoers and our government. And, um, and it's very heartening to see them there in the the statue, uh, statuary hall, 
um, although it does, in fact, conjure up memories of soldiers doing the same uh, in 1861. So let's just hope we're not going that direction and that we can, in fact, um, reclaim American democracy from those who would do it harm. Well, I think you're doing democracy a great service with your letters and your writing and your teaching. And I really appreciate you coming on here today. And I, I loved having you as a professor and I hope to talk to you soon. Terrific. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much.